I'm guessing that the two scripture passages we just read are familiar to you, perhaps especially the one from Genesis. Any of us who have ever tried to read the Bible from cover to cover have at least managed to get through the first chapter. In the beginning, right there at the beginning of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it goes on to tell the story of what God did in those first seven days. God was busy. Some traditions say that God started this process with nothing. If you like to use Latin phrases, you can use the word ex nihilo, from nothing. But if you look at this Bible passage, this Genesis passage, really closely, you'll notice that God didn't start creating this world with a blank slate. God had something to work with, because we're told the earth was a formless void. Well, those are the words we use in English anyway. The Hebrew words are tohu and bohu. And scholars have struggled for centuries about how to translate those Hebrew words into English ones. They're pretty sure that tohu means something like void. But bohu, that word, is only found in this one verse in the Bible. So they can't really compare it in the context of other parts of the Bible to figure out for sure what it means. The Bible I studied in seminary, the Revised Standard Version, translates these two Hebrew words as without form or void. They revised that Bible since then. Now the New Revised Standard Version calls it a formless void. That's what God was starting out with. The truth is we really aren't sure exactly how to translate that phrase. One rabbi has joked that maybe the best translation would be Void schmoid. <laughs> it's a mess. This whole translation thing can be such a mess. And I think that mirrors the mess, the chaos that God started with. It is a mess. That much is clear. Maybe it's a little bit like the junk drawer in your kitchen or in your attic or your garage or maybe your whole house, maybe your whole life. Things can get messy at times. But in this story in Genesis, God shows up. God shows up like some kind of cosmic closet organizer. And he gets to busy organizing, separating things. But it's interesting. God doesn't just take all this big chaos and throw it in a few boxes and name one formless day one and void day two. He doesn't just put them on boxes and label them Stuff and junk. That's what my parents did when they moved from one state to another. God didn't do that. God doesn't let the mess that he started out with affect what was going to get created next. God looked at that mess and God saw possibilities and got to work. And by the power of God, that primal chaos, that mess, is transformed into this earth. God started it right out, separating the light out. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters. And God called that dome sky. And God allowed dry land and oceans also to divide and show up. And God saw that it was good. What was it? It was good, yes. And then God let the earth bring forth vegetation, plants and fruity trees, and it was wonderful. It was good. And God said, let there be lights in the sky. And God made two lights, the sun and the moon and the stars, and God said it was good, very good. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let the birds fly across the sky, and God said it was good. 
And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind. And it did, and God said, it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over everything that creeps on the earth. And so God created humankind in God's image. Male and female, he created them. And God looked at everything he had created, everything he had made, and indeed, it was good. My version says it was very good. The whole thing was very good. And then God said, OK, listen up, people. I've got everything all organized here for you. And God handed it over to us. And we promptly, exactly two chapters later, started making one heck of a mess. I'd use another word, but my mother wouldn't like it. I was wrestling with this, trying to figure out what happened here. And I'm wondering if maybe we can blame the scholars who translated Genesis for us. We already know they're having trouble with that phrase, formless void. Maybe the way they translated that later word, that word dominion, is what's tripped us up. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion. Dominion. Somewhere along the way, we got the idea that dominion means help yourself to everything here, feel free to use it up. Or, or just take what you want and throw away the rest. It's fine, whatever, it's up to you. The other sort of funny thing that I noticed this week as I was looking at this passage, which I know so well, but I hadn't noticed this before, verse 26 says that God put us in charge of the fish, the birds, the cattle, the wild animals, and every creeping thing didn't say anything else about the other things that God sorted out. The sky, the land, the oceans, plants, sun, moon, and stars. I wonder if maybe we helped ourselves to a little more than God intended. Well, scholars have been rapidly backtracking, covering their tracks, and now they tell us that when they said dominion, they meant that God said we should be good stewards good caretakers of all the creatures that swim, fly, and walk. It's pretty clear that our lives are woven together with our environment. We are interrelated, the world around us and ourselves, us people. There are ties that bind us between creation and ourselves. It's sort of like this picture on the front of your bulletin. Interwoven. God intended for us to be interwoven with love for each other and all creation. Sometimes it isn't such a pretty thing. Sometimes the environment impacts us. All those natural disasters that come along, right? Floods, earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunami, you name it. There are a lot of them that negatively impact our lives. Sometimes there are deer that jump in front of your car on your way to work, and that negatively impacts both your car and the deer. But there are also so many positive ways that creation impacts our lives. The beauty of the great outdoors, the sunshine, that warms our faces sometimes. The cool breezes when we get hot. Wonderful, clean oxygen to breathe, at least in some places. Of course, there are many ways how we impact our environment. 
we know there's so many bad things that we have done and we've kind of made a mess of things. I think we've got a slide here to show you at this point. Coming up in just a minute. Nope, not that one. Can I have the next one? There we go. This does not match what's on your cover of your bulletin. This, I, I think I'm pretty crafty, but when I tried to make this, I tried two times and, you know, it got slightly better the second time, but does that, that does not look like a heart. <laughs> it's remarkably hard, and I was very glad when somebody in our congregation said, those are hard to make. So I felt a little bit better. But sometimes even when we're trying to make everything interwoven beautifully with love, we can make kind of a mess of it. I don't need to tell you all the ways we've made a mess of our environment. You know them already. Pollution, paving over the ground, lots of ways. So that's the bad news. Here's the good news. In recent years, maybe back in the 1970s or maybe even earlier, we started to look around and realize that we weren't doing such a good job of taking care of our environment. We knew we'd better start taking better care of the Earth. And there's definitely been a movement to do that. We as a church have made an effort to do that. Now we can see that other slide that popped up before. Our good earth garden right outside was started many years ago. And you see on the left side of the slide the wonderful grapes that are growing, or the vines that are growing the grapes, that produce wonderful communion juice for us. The first time I ever had a sip of our communion juice I said, wow, give me another glass. <laughs> but you all were watching, so I couldn't. <laughs> this is an example of one thing we are doing as a church to help the environment. There are so many others. We, we recycle lots of paper things and glasses and jars here. We don't use styrofoam cups anymore at coffee hour. We use fair trade coffee. We're in the midst now of trying to make our lighting in the church even more efficient, and maybe we'll handle the parking lot later. As a church, we have heard this word from Genesis that we need to be good caretakers of the earth, to bind ourselves with the environment in ways that fill all of us with love. I'm sure that all of you do other things as individuals to take care of God's earth. And that is a wonderful thing. So the good news is that we are trying to clean up the mess that we started, the mess that we created after God handed things over to us. The good news is that God doesn't give up on us. God is patient. God is giving us time to sort things out. God, over time, has sent us prophets God sent us his son, Jesus, and God sent his Holy Spirit to us, which still moves among us, encouraging us to be good caretakers of this environment so that the ties that bind us together may be, in fact, blessed and bind us together in love. Thanks be to God. Amen.